the legendary Molly Boland Kazmer is here. We've got more WBL stories that have to be heard to be believed. Locked on Women's Basketball starts now. You are Locked on Women's Basketball. Your daily podcast on women's basketball. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to Locked On Women's Basketball. I am your host, Howard Megdahl, reminding you you can follow us at Locked On WBB. You make us your first listen every day by subscribing wherever you get podcasts, including YouTube. And of course, our entire staff is covering women's basketball, past, present, and future at thenexthoops.com. Make sure you check out the work we're doing, over 100 reported pieces every single month. And a critical part of what we're doing, and something that uh, fills me with all kinds of emotions, uh, pride, frustration over delays, regret when you go back and read and see what didn't happen, but also just immense satisfaction over getting to tell these stories, the stories of the WBL. And WBL, for those of you who may not know, was a, a professional basketball league for women from 1978 through 1981. There are ample reasons to believe it was both of its time, overdue, and yet it was something that is in a lot of areas forgotten. And Molly Boland Kazmer is as legendary a performer as there was in that league. So Molly's here, she's taking the time to chat with us. Uh, we have a great story about Molly up at thenexthoops.com that uh, T Baker did as well. Uh, Molly, first of all, just when you think about that history, that history of the WBL, I know it's gotta be very hard that split between amazement at what was done and frustration about what wasn't done. How do you kind of balance those two things as you think through that, that time? You know, I think over the years, your perspectives do shift a little bit. And, you know, while we were all in and so, you know, uh, dedicated, excited to pave the way for women's pro basketball, we also believed in it 1000%. -hmm. I mean, I would have done anything to help that league succeed. And I did basically, I mean, I took low salaries, you know, I did marketing and promotions all over the league and and uh, with the media and stuff like that. But, um, you know, it you just go through a period of time where, you know, it happened. We pursued I was involved with five different attempts at women's pro basketball prior to the WNBA. So but you go through stages of sort of like you're all excited and, and you believe in it. And it's going to happen and then uh, disappeared and we got it going again and it disappeared again. So. There's long gaps of time to where it just felt like, you know, it didn't really, you know, mean anything until the WNBA came along. And now that they've celebrated, um, you know, they're in their 26th season. It's it's incredibly um, rewarding for those of us who know that we broke down some some barriers and, and paved the trail for the WNBA. You said something so interesting to me just before we got on the air where you talked about it was so much in the hands of just a handful of male sports writers and they either liked you or they didn't, that's how you put it. Do you feel mm -hmm. as if, cause you know, it's so striking to me, the, the patterns when you go back and you read the history of, as it was written at the time, you know, mm -hmm. there was this assumption that women's basketball wouldn't succeed. That was the implicit thing. And every time there was a bit of success, that was the exception. And every time there was a setback as there has been in, every men's sport you can think of that was treated as the rule do you feel as if it had been framed by different people by people who were uh more buying in you know if there were more women involved that you that it would have been something that could have succeeded uh just from messaging alone at that time well you know that's that's a great point because um you know, when I was going back and uh, with our organization, Legends of the Ball, Inc., I put together a narrative of the league. And I realized in year after we succeeded the first year, uh, getting through the season with eight, all eight teams intact, mm -hmm. there was a huge amount of interest and people wanted to be owners. The NBA was looking at us. Um, you know, Larry O'Brien showed up at our at our draft. I mean, 
there was so much um, going for us going into that year too. Ann Myers Drysdale had just tried out with the Indiana Pacers and, mm -hmm. and then came over to the league and we needed that name recognition. So we started this season on such a high note that it was, you know, it was so easy to, um, to visualize that success, you know, at that point. But, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, especially for me, because I was more of a, a you know, a media type person for the league where I was a spokesperson. I did a lot of interviews and all that sort of thing. I feel that I really had to win over everyone that we, you know, especially from the men's side, because we did have a great support group from the men. I mean, they were like a big core group of our, our fans. Mm -hmm. And actually I think in some places the women were harder to win over than the men were. So, um, you know, but we experienced enough success like in Iowa and Chicago, we both had really great fan bases. And especially in Iowa, where they have that history of that six on six girls basketball that I that I had played was so successful that it was sort of a built in acceptance, um, you know, in the in the fan base in Iowa. It's so striking to me the way in which you essentially straddle eras in that way, where you're playing six on six, which we think about as, you know, kind of prior to the modern era. But in so many ways, the type of player you were and for those we should probably make sure our listeners know, uh, you know, so people are aware of it, that you average 55 points per game in Moravia High School uh, playing in Iowa. You once scored 83 in a game. You know, those who have seen you played have uh, rightly so compared your game to Steph Curry. Now, I want to talk about some women to women comps in the current league because we have such a rich history in women's basketball that we can and absolutely should be doing that as well. But have you ever thought about just the way in which your career really helped usher in the modern era and, and in many ways, the way the WNBA is playing basketball right now? I think so. You know, we definitely were ahead of our time, um, especially in Iowa, because, um, you know, they played, they had the women's uh, or the Iowa Girls High School Athletic Association. Mm -hmm. And that's another point I'll make later on. But it's just that they formed this and we had our own game, our own uh, our own attraction, our own draw. They didn't compare us to the boys. And so, because the girls game was played a little differently and we were high scoring and the transition was so quick that we packed the gyms all through high school. And, uh, you know, the media paid attention to us. They, they honored and recognized us as, uh, and elevated us as athletes in high mm -hmm. school. So I was experiencing that opportunity way before, you know, during the time inception of Title IX and, and even before that, um, so I didn't go through a lot of the difficulties that the rest of the country was going through prior to Title IX. So, um, but it was just amazing because the the um, opportunities to go to a basketball camp and learn from the best, develop your fundamentals, um, especially in the, the, it's basically three on three half court because I only played offense right. with two dribbles. So you have to create a shot within one or two dribbles and create an opening. You are not going to just get to stand there and be open and take a shot. So that trained me to develop a quick move, a jump shot, knowing how to get open without the ball, um, knowing how to make a move with one or two dribbles. Um, it just, it totally was ahead of its time. And I think fitting into the WNBA today, um, I would call what I did more of a mid range shot, mm -hmm. which I think we've got, you know, the game has shifted uh, a little bit away from that because the three pointer is such, such a significant part of the game now. And then if they come out them, to them on the three-point line, then they take them to the hoop and, and get some great drives in there. So, um, yeah, so I was really kind of more of a mid-range shooter. Even though I could shoot from long range, mm -hmm. the three-pointers didn't count when I played. But in all likelihood, I, I mean, that would have just been your focus. You would have I, – I, I see this all the time, There's the conversation, you know, oh, well, that player was more of a mid-range shooter. Well, sure, because that was what the rules of the game dictated at that time. Right. I mean, you, right. you just would have spent all your time outside – outside the arc, I, I, I would imagine, or, or a great deal of it, right? Well, not only that, but the way I learned in the fundamental is that you create and, and get into your shooting range for your highest percentage shot. So just the fact that a three-point sh shooting range is maybe at the best, what, 35%, mm -hmm. you know, on the average. I mean, there's people that get hot out there, but um, that's why it was discouraged. Even in the pros, we uh, the WBL eventually adapted the three-point uh, line the second right. season. But it was such a low percentage shot that I would literally get yanked out of a game, even though I could shoot long range. It was not that high percentage shot. Mm -hmm. So um, I learned to create a shot within the 10 to 25 foot, uh, 15 to 25 foot 
jump shot range, which I knew could be consistently uh, at 50% or if I got hot much higher. Mm -hmm. So when you think about the players who are playing right now, are you looking at like a Courtney Williams, who is the master in the mid range? When you think about comps to the way you played, is it someone like uh, the one that jumps out at me? Just when I hear your description, I hear about uh, the way in which you played is Kelsey Plum, uh, who I've been privileged to cover since college and she was able to create her own shot and obviously had the mid range. Um, but you know, she's been, you know, north of 40% from three. Uh, what do you see? And, and, and who, you know, who do you feel is, uh, let's say walking in your footsteps most. Completely? <laughs> well, you know, Howard, I've been around for a while, so I've seen a few generations of WNBA players come and go, but, um, it's always great to see, um, you know, the development of the game. And I did have the opportunity to go to the WNBA All-Star Game this year and saw Kelsey Plum win the MVP. So, uh, yeah, I just, I love to see that. Um, I love uh, Sabrina Ionescu. Um, mm-hmm. You know, she's just so, and I, 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 for some, she reminds me so much, I don't know about you, Caitlin Clark from Iowa, is that she controls the ball. She creates things on the court. She can, she can take that long range shot, but then she'll penetrate in the, and create something and then pass out a great, uh, you know, passer as well. So I think that's, and I think Steph Curry really um, might've been one of the first to really create all that where he was such a, such a, um, a, a threat from long range that you couldn't leave him alone. But if you came out on him, he'd drive and create something and dish off. And I see uh, a lot of the women's games sort of, you know, really uh, sort of following along that. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a great aspect and a great, you know, uh, new point of the WNBA that they're doing this. I totally agree. I, I cover both Steph Curry and I've covered Caitlin Clark in college, and I think she's simply doing that. Uh, and it's remarkable to see the 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 playmaking too. I mean, she does this assist percentage of forty. I, I she she will be an all star the moment she gets to the WNBA. Uh, but let's take it back if we can to there was this moment and you talked a little bit about it. Uh, to tea in the story, but I want you to uh, bring our listeners into it. You're trying out for the 1976 U.S. Olympic team. I mean, you just go back and you look at, you know, you mentioned Annie, you know, Ann Myers Drysdale uh, is on that team and Nancy Lieberman's on that team. And like, take me through what that experience was like for you in that moment, what you remember about it. Oh, it was, it was incredible. It was really my first time uh, ever playing five on five. I mean, let's let's take us from, you know, growing up and learning the six on six game. And then all of a sudden, like, OK, you're going to try five on five. But your first experience, you're going to go to the finals of the Olympic tryouts. You know? <laughs> so, um, you know, I remember uh, my senior year just working out on my own, getting prepared for that, um, you know, trying to play with the boys, you know, that sort of thing. And of course, you know, the transition game does take time to come, not only just getting up, you know, that transition of getting up and down the court, but of flipping over from offense to defense, which, you know, we didn't have to do, even though I played, um, you know, in six on six, we could defend the player, the defensive players that had the ball and I would steal the ball away from them and, you know, play defense on them that way, but not, not to defend the basket. But it was, it was such an amazing experience because in the, in the first round, which was regionals, I'm in this huge, this gym of like a hundred players. And I'm thinking, wow, you know, so much talent here. I don't have a chance. And then I remember them calling my name to go to the finals. And I'm looking around at my camp counselors and the people that taught me the game and they're still sitting there. And I was just like stunned, you know, at that time. And then um, going to the finals, I wish I could remember more about it, but it was such an overwhelming experience that it was kind of more like, you know, just trying to be really competitive and survive. But, you know, I mean, Pat Head Summit was playing there. Um, You know, Trish Roberts was, was on that team. Um, oh gosh, all the greats uh, from that era with that 76 team, the, the core of them were right there um, at that tryout. So um, I just remember they were so just blown away by my scoring average and they were looking at me. And when I, I did get cut from the team, I remember getting called into a room and being told, you know, we've got your our eyes on you for the future, but you're just not there yet. You need to have some more full court experience and learn the transition game. And, you know, be ready for the for the 1980 Olympics. And I was like, whoa. I mean, I was just, you know, I, I was so stoked by that experience that, um, you know, because I didn't really expect to get that far that soon. Well, it, it's an incredible accomplishment to reach the finals. And there's a lot 
to unpack in there from what happens next with the WBL and, of course, 1980, the great team that wasn't. Um, but w- before we get to that, I do want to take a moment and talk about betonline.net, which is the fastest and easiest way to check on all your betting needs. And again, I am not a betting person, but I do recognize and believe there needs to be equality. So it matters to me that at betonline.net, they have NCAA women's basketball lines, they have WNBA lines. So you can find reviews and news of every league, not just Major League Baseball, not just the NFL, but the women's leads as well. Bet Online continues to be a top online resource for all your sports wagering information. So head to Bet Online today or use your mobile device to learn more about the action happening. Bet Online, where the game starts. So as we think about what comes from there, okay, you're 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 a cut from the 76 team, but the WBL in many ways comes from the success we saw in 1976 and that in that group under Billy Moore. And certainly the pecking order has changed by 1978. You are, as I understand it, the very first player to sign with the WBL. So there is an understanding about your elite level of talent. What did that mean to you in that moment? And what do you remember about them approaching you for that very first opportunity? You know, that was, um, I was, I was uh, ready to, to find another college because I had two years of college eligibility left. Mm-hmm. And of course, you know, the rules were, were different then too, because once you turned pro, you also could compete in the Olympics. So that mm-hmm. held up a lot of players, one of the top players like, um, you know, Carol Blaisjowski, Nancy Lieberman, and even Annie Myers passed on that first year because they had their eyes on the 1980 Olympic team. And rightfully so, you know, because that's a huge honor. But um, it was just amazing because um, Iowa was the first team to join the WBL. Uh, George Nissen, our owner, uh, was well known. He invented the trampoline and um, he, he was, uh, you know, very progressive uh, mm-hmm. in the way he wanted to promote and, and his team. And he saw a great chance for success in Iowa. So it was awesome because uh, they said, you know, we decided that, you know, we want you to be the player you know, to represent the league, to, to sign your contract. So I went into the governor's office, sat at his desk, you know, I'm 20 years old, um, big press conference there. And, um, and it went out on the AP wire services and everything. So it was, it was pretty amazing to to have that opportunity. And I had no idea at that point, you know, was, you know, was, was this going to be something that I'm just going to sit on the bench the whole time? Am I going to get a play? And um, so it was, it was really cool to, to get to, you know, be the first one to step forward uh, with with a pro contract in the United States. And then from there, it, it really was kind of an up- uphill battle for me because I didn't really get on the court that first season until, um, you know, a- after the end of the year. And one of the players got hurt and I got a chance to play because they didn't, just didn't. I'd only had two years of college and they didn't feel like I was quite ready yet. Sure. So what are you doing at that moment day to day to work on your game? What are what are you, you know, what's allowing you to continue to get better because in a lot of ways and 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 this is again the thing that blows me away when i think back to to your story specifically is you had to chart an uncharted path in so many of these different ways now you know there are players at every level and there's still obviously room to grow and to get to this point where there's an understanding of here's what you're doing to get better here's here are your personal trainers here are your specific oh, i wish people. so what what was it for you what was what was getting better as a player every day for you in that moment what would you do you know it, it was it was the opportunities you know and the trainers and all that just didn't exist um and on top of that in my two years of college uh uh competition this the they were non-consecutive because the first year we played um we, we, we had a national, they were all players from Iowa that played six on six, but we played 11 of the top 20 teams in the country, including uh, Delta State with Lucy Harris, uh, the year that they won their second national championship. So we played a very competitive, went to the national tournament and everything. Then the second year of my college, um, I got married and sat out when my son was born. Mm-hmm. And then when I came back for the next season, the whole team had disappeared and it was just me returning. And the team had gone one in 22 the year I was gone. So, um, you know, it, it, it was it was more or less just just pure um, determination because 
every year that I played, I played 10 seasons of basketball from high school, college, and through the pros. Mm -hmm. And every year I had a different coach. Oh. So I didn't have any consistent coaching, um, you know, so it was pretty much just, but you know what happened was the love as the level of the play rose. And I think we still see this in the development of the WNBA, but mm -hmm. um, you know, the game and in, in continues to, you know, to rise the level of the sport. So it's just that I was so competitive that I would find a way to, you know, the tougher it was, the tougher I got to, to stay in there and to compete with that. So um, it just, it took a while for me to, to get an opportunity to get on the floor. And then, you know, somehow that Iowa scoring mentality just took over, you know, because I expected to be a scorer. I mean, it was just, it was in my, my makeup as a player. I, I find it very hard to believe that after you scored 55 points per game in high school, that they took a full year to let you get out onto the court. But apparently it happened that way. So can you tell me just once you got there, I, I mean, you had the mentality of a scorer. I mean, I, I, I hear it. I hear the way you're talking about it now. I think it's not any surprise that um, you speak about your game in terms of Sabrina Inescu as well, who is somebody who has absolute confidence when she's out there. Once you got that chance, did you have any question in your mind that it was going to happen for you? None. I mean, um, but it, it was about two months, I guess, or three months because I was, they were, they were, so we had a coaching change right before the start of the season. They fired the coach that they hired. So that was, so it was a bit of a disarray and, right. um, and they were platooning, trying to figure out who was going to play. So they were sitting in five and then sitting in five. Well, I was the last two of the 12 to get on the court and they just wanted to be like a designated shooter. Well, it doesn't work like right. that. You have to get in the flow of the game and uh, your shots have to come within the flow of the game. So I remember um, one of the first opportunities I had a chance to, to really stay on the court. Um, mm -hmm. I think I, that was against Milwaukee, um, like early 1979 uh, in the first season. And I scored 38 points in, in half at, you know, in one half. And so they were kind of like, okay, she can play. <laughs> then um, about a month later, um, I set the first WBL scoring record with 53 points. And I was like 19 for 25 from the floor. So I, I had kind of sealed my place uh, on the team by then. 53, of course, also the record in the WNBA uh, for a single game uh, held by Liz Cambage. So that's just a, a, a nice little bit of symmetry there. I find almost as fascinating as the basketball itself, which is just, again, it's aggravating. And you talked about this. It's aggravating that we don't have film, that we don't have a video to be able to understand, be able to see it and be able to um, enjoy that period of time in the same way. But you had to navigate off the court as well, figuring out fame as a female athlete. And just, you know, to kind of set the stage for people, um, you were on posters, you were um, somebody who was marketed, um, you know, for your looks as well as your uh, ability to score the basketball. And I just, I wondered kind of two parts to it. One is, um, whether that was challenging for you at that time to navigate that balance yourself. I'm not talking about external perceptions. We know those are fraught. Those were fraught and are fraught now. And then I just, I just wonder if you, if you think it would be a fundamentally different experience today where uh, a lot of these same conversations are still happening. You know, that's true because, um, you know, in that second season of the WBL, um, we got a new coach, of course, and um, and as I approached the man, we had a new general manager, and I, I approached them to renegotiate my contract, and uh, they were not giving me much a raise. And while I understand, I mean, there's a balance between you know your salaries and what you know, you know, you don't want your team to like make promises they can't keep either, you know. So I decided at that point that if I was going to make the money I wanted to make, that I had to go outside. Of, you know, go into the more of the marketing aspect of it. And at the time, if you, you know, 1979, 1980, the poster business was really big. And I'd been reading about, you know, because really, I mean, it was the jump between the competitive and, and the marriage between competitive sports and entertainment and marketing. And somehow at 20, 21 years old, I understood that, that it was more than just a game that you had to perform on the court to get the fans in the gym, but you also had to promote it and be entertaining. And you had to, create some kind of a, 
you know, a, a following. And so uh, when I didn't get the contract that I wanted, I approached the team about making posters and they agreed to cover the expenses of it, but it would be my own business. Mm -hmm. So I was basically the, um, the original NIL right. <laughs> marketing person right. in women's pro basketball. And um, so, we made, so we made the posters. Unfortunately, they were black and white. But um, and then that went well. So I, I made some T-shirts and sold them at games and did mail order and all that sort of thing. But mm -hmm. what happened at the same time that just made that more successful is the coach had a strategy of the number two guard, which was me, got most of the shots in the game. So all of a sudden, the second year in the pros, I'm getting 25 to 35 shots a game. That's a mm -hmm. lot of shots. Yeah. And not only that, but they were running the plays. They were setting the picks. I had some great teammates unselfish teammates, Doris Draving, powerful rebounder, Robin Tucker, Sister Green, great point guard passers. I had people setting picks for me. So I, you know, I owe a lot of that to them as well, but I also got a lot of shots. So all of a sudden I'm averaging, you know, I averaged 32.8 uh, right. that season. So that combined with the posters, it just went boom. You know, it was, and it was just a thrilling, exciting time because I, I just saw the future opening up. And I was always aware the whole time I was playing that we were on borrowed time. And I was determined more than ever to try to create a future for myself beyond my playing days. And I just didn't get enough. I was on the path, but I didn't get enough time to do that. I mean, you say borrowed time in terms of an athlete's career being short or in terms of just worrying about the WBL's long-term sustainability or, or is it both? Both. Both, because, you know, even, that's the other interesting aspect is that when we first started playing pro ball, I had no idea women could play till they were 35 or 40 years old. Right. You know, the whole um, career span at that point was maybe 30 at the most. Yeah. And so, um, you know, we didn't expect that because no one had done it before. Mm -hmm. So we didn't really know what the longevity was. And even now I've read some great articles about uh, what Sue Bird and, uh, has done physically in her training and her discipline to have played the level of play that she has for so long. Mm -hmm. And it's it's just, it's so groundbreaking, you know, what she's done. But that, again, that's opened the doors for the future of, you know, what's the longevity of a, of a you know, women pro basketball player. So uh, that and the fact that the uh, we were still getting a lot of, not everywhere, but in some of the markets, some real negative uh, backlash because the constant comparison, and this is something um, I want to say even about the WNBA is that, you can't have a constant comparison to the man. You have to have your own product, um, you know, win your fans over on your own terms. And yes, while they're, you know, brother, sister organization, because without, you know, the NBA stepped up and made it happen. Um, mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that you constantly compare them. And that goes for on the court and off the court. You know, the NBA plays 82 games and, uh, you know, the WNBA is what getting up to 36 this year. They're looking at 40. Right. So right there, it's not apples to apples. And um, and while I am all 1,000% in for women to be paid what they're worth on the court, too, a, a comparison to a w, uh, NBA player is not a good comparison either. And it's not advantageous for, for them to do that because it's not the same. And, and you shouldn't encourage those comparisons because you're your own market. You're your own product. Uh, and you should be independently uh you know, viewed and you got your own fan base and everything from the men. What's really interesting about it and, and every, every bit of that, I agree with you 100%, but it's more that the NBA is often used as a comparison point. Uh, and, and that's a flawed thing for any number of reasons, not least of which, because the level of investment on the front end is so much larger on the NBA side. If you water one plant one time, right in a month and you order the other plant every single day. And at the end of the month, you say, ah, gee, that one, that first plant so much bigger, it must be a better plant. You know, it's just. Right, right. Well, not just, to mention they're 50 years ahead. That's it. That's right. And you, you <laughs> no, they're they're celebrating their 70th birth anniversary, 75th anniversary. And, um, you know, so there's another reason not to encourage it because, you know, I see some things online and comments of people and, 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 and the, the only negative stuff I see is the comparisons with the men. And, um, you know, I just, I just don't think that's something that's, you know, it's good for the players. It's not good for the league. You know, um, they've got a great product and it's getting better all the time. 
but you don't match them up against the NBA. It, well, but not only that, but, you know, every time we do that, what do we lose? We lose the uh, current comparisons to other women's basketball players whenever the conversation shifts like mm-hmm. that. And you and you lose the history. You lose the history right. in the process. Right. So I just think I, it feels like missed opportunities whenever the conversation. Well, that's one thing we could do like the NBA is that they honor and, and recognize their history where the, right. the women, I think that's an important step for their longevity and, and for their um, importance in, in the uh, sports market is to recognize the history and the steps that got them where they are. Nothing, and that way they will be forgotten down the road as well. Nothing against Penny Toller and that first basket in the WNBA and the Sparks and the Liberty, but it was not the first professional women's basket. It was just the first WNBA basket. And I feel like that, that gets conflated way too often, way too often. Yeah. Um, I, so uh, we, we've got to continue this conversation. We've got to have multiple podcast conversations. Um, I, if, if you'll be good enough to join us again uh, soon. Um, but I, I, I see we're past time and I didn't get to like 80% of what I want to talk to you about. Um, I do, though, want to talk about the way in which things are being honored this year. I know you were out in Chicago for the All-Star Game, uh, which I'm I'm really gratified that the WBL was honored uh, out there. But take me through who were some of the players you were talking to? Who are some of the folks out there on the WNBA side? And how much you feel like there is a growing understanding of the role the WBL has played in where we are today? Oh, no, no question. Uh, we've got some great champions with the WNBA. Uh, Tamika Catchings has been huge. When she was inducted, she um, she called us out. You know, she saw us at the autograph session and we, you know, we had a chance to talk and she saw what we were about. Um, you know, NECA at the Sparks has been amazing. I did a, a piece with her on the Title IX history. It's a four-part docuseries on ESPN and got a chance to interact with her. And then I ran into her at the All-Star Game and she's been super supportive. And I just so much admire what what she's doing, you know, off the court with the Players Association. And just, it's like, wow, just blows my mind, you know, where where they're at with that. But yeah, I mean, it's just been really positive. Ran into Diana Taurasi at the Hall of Fame. And I was like, hey, you know, know, I, I hold the record at 55 and by the way, I dislocated my shoulder in that game. She's like, no. <laughs> so it was just really cool, you know, to interact and touch base and share history with uh, the current players. All right. Well, so let's continue this conversation on uh, podcasts to come. If, you, if you'll make the time for us. Um, oh, absolutely. Because- it's fun. Okay. I'm glad. And, and, and again, we talked about this a little bit ahead of time, but it is a real honor for me to be able to tell these stories and for you guys to spend the time with us uh, on the written side of the next hoops.com and being able to tell them here at locked on women's basketball means the world uh, to me. So to be my WBL jacket on. Oh, there you I, go. <laughs> awesome. That is awesome. Is that an original? Is that, is that, where is, is that from? My Iowa Cornette jacket. Yeah. Oh my God. That is amazing. There's a story behind that one too, but we, we wore this as a, uh, that's okay. Tell me the tell me the story. Let's go over. I, we I, we I, look I, like a gang walking around in our jackets. And the, the, one of the funniest things was when we hit uh, uh, New Orleans during Mardi Gras, and we're all yeah. walking in our green jackets through town, and everybody's like parting the ways, so we, thinking we we're going to beat them up. You know, <laughs> that's awesome. That's yeah, awesome. it was it was pretty fun. Well, Molly, it is such a pleasure to chat with you and to all of our listeners. Obviously, thank you for being part of this. Well, more with Molly to come. Thank you for making us your first listen every day. Now, for your second listen, uh, I want to tell you about a show I, I've just heard about. There's apparently that men are getting the chance to play basketball professionally. It's called the National Basketball Association. Uh, I'm immersed in the women's game. I haven't really heard about it. Are you familiar with it at all, Molly? Have you heard about the NBA? <laughs> apparently yeah, a time player. or two. It just yeah. kind of creeps into my social media every now and then. You and me both. Well, if you follow the NBA, once you've listened to us, once you've gotten your women's game fixed, go to Locked On NBA and you can hear about the NBA uh, every day, 30 minutes uh, covering uh, the National Basketball Association. Uh, Molly, thank you for your time. Thank you to our listeners every day. We will be back with you tomorrow as well as we are every weekday covering women's basketball. I'm Howard Magdal wishing you a wonderful day. You are locked.
Locked On Women's Basketball. Your daily podcast on women's basketball. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day.